It was a collection of sculptures, video pieces, installations, and work on paper with audio components. Rather than framing sound as medium, event, or corporeal vibration, this, this show, a first of its kind at MoMA, was exploring sound with a strong emphasis on material and object-based visual dimension. To critics and thinkers alike, this show accelerated the otherwise dormant debate around sound arts position within gallery and museum dominated mainstream public showcasing of sound art. I'll now go through some of the comments. This debate suggests a deep confusion and uncertainty about how sound art is defined, if it is at all definable. From my perspective, however, the central question is, can sound be exhibited with an art exhibitory context? Is not that problematic given the nature of sound as predominantly as ephemeral and immaterial phenomenon? This is a question that complicates the positioning of sound art in the contemporary field of artistic and curatorial practices, demanding a new set of theoretical approaches and method methodologies. The somewhat sectarian attitudes reflected in these comments made by artists and critics after the show at MoMA explain why the so-called exhibition of sound art triggered serious thoughts about the matter of the artistic object in relation to sound. Let us have a brief self-guided tour through the development of sound art in the Western art historical tradition. The idea of sound art moves from Luigi Russolo's noise intoners and subsequent experiments by Dadaists, Surrealists, and the Situationist International to fluxus happenings and environments, forming a trajectory that leads to what Setkin Cohen terms at the conceptual turn in the post-war period, following John Cage's works with sound in itself on one hand, and the emergence and sporadic inclusion of sound in the gallery or museum-based arts on the other. Because of the apparent diversity of what is termed sound art, there are often debates about whether sound art falls within the domain of visual art, experimental music, or new media or whether it, it falls between the categories. However, there has been a definitive surge in the cultural production and dissemination of sound art in the last few years, which has garnered intense attention, but these intensifying activities have occurred rather tentatively and ambivalently, as Brandon Labelle claims. This ambivalence surrounding sound art stems from the fact that more often than not, sound art has been framed within the practice, production, and showcasing of the visual arts. The problem in this taxonomy lies in the fact that there are basic and fundamental differences between oral and visual representation that we cannot ignore. Sound can be seen as mysterious and ineffable, or transient and ephemeral, or immediate and indeterminate, in comparison to its implied visual counterparts, the objects that are visible in re relation to diffusion of sound in space. Therefore, sound art as a term cannot exist in a representational vacuum due to its inherent characteristics. Brendan Lovell comments, it seems sound art continues to hold an unsettled place within artistic institu institutions 
which could be say, said to unearth the impasse between an overly visual institutional structure with an intensely sonic medium. He mentions in this respect the comments of Barn Schulz, the curator from Stadt Gallery Saarbrücken. The inexpressibility and cognitive impenetrability of the phenomenal expedience make, make it difficult to secure for sound art the place it deserves in the art world. Seth Kim Cohen has described sound art as the unwanted child of music. He has pointed out the boundaries, tendencies, and specific shifts in post-war sound art practice after P.S. Schaeffer's experiments with music concrete and John Cage's experiments with silence, paving the way for a conceptual turn. Following traditional scholarships in sound and place, such as Murray Schaeffer's works at Simon Fraser University, terms such as soundscapes, acoustic ecology, and soundscape composition were used to describe specific sound practices embedded with a strictly environmental aesthetics. But I'll argue that these practices were inherently constrained with predominantly musical structures and ecological contexts. This paradigm of sound practice with recorded and composed soundscapes does not substantially contribute to the so-called conceptual turn sound art would subsequently experience. Sound art seems less esoteric in the new media environment because of our newfound comfort with the immaterial world of pure data and information flowing through the cyberspace. The new media allows for the separation of sounds from their locations and facilitate their travel across globally dispersed networks at digital data and information. Sound that is disembodied from its locational specificity falls within multiple layers of mediation across multiple levels of reception and interpretation outside of place, time, and context in the new media environment, whether in an audio streaming network on the internet, a multi-channel sonic environment, a telematic performance, or an exhibition in augmented space of an interactive installation work. It is evident that in this space of constant and itinerant flow, the production and reception of sound over greater mobility and interactivity lead to its interpretation as a fertile and more alive auditory situation rather than being posed at static material of sonic artifact. Therefore, I may assume that sound art is more comfortable discussed within the object unspecific, essentially immaterial, and multiply interpretative new media art paradigm. Such positioning of sound art is necessary to comprehend my following argument. The fluid and ephemeral worlds of sound, as impermanent as it might seem to the ears of a wandering listener, may open hidden doors and obscure entrances that invite further perceptual meanderings, disrupting the epistemic knowledge and immediate meaning that the sounds would otherwise embody. The epistemological problems and ontological questions embedded in an inclusive but private mode of listening suggest an object disoriented behavior of sound manifesting in an explosion of multifarious meanings, interpretations, and mental states dispersed outside of the sonic object. In his seminal writings, for instance, in the article Oral object, film sound scholar and early phenomenologist Christian Metz expressed serious doubts about the object specificity of sonic phenomena in scholarly thinking following Schaeffer. Metz instead focused on the characteristics of sound and emphasized the problematic aspect of locating sound's object oriented or location specific meaning. He stated that spatial anchoring. of oral events is much more vague and uncertain than that of visual events. In classical sound studies, scholars such as Rick Altman have already underpinned the issue of sound's problematic relation to its object or source 
and emphasized its interpretative nature following its emergence. Sound is not actualized until it reaches the ear of the hearer, which translates molecular movement into the sensation of sound. Altman speaks here of a sound event as defining the trajectory of the essential production and subsequent reception of sound. Its narrative, as Altman terms it, is hypothetically bound to the source that produces it. These special sources of sound or the sounding object when producing sound are specially defined or con connected to a place, but are not rendered until and unless they are carried by a medium, such as a tape recording, to reach the point of reception and subsequent interpretation. By the same token, sounds are remediated whenever they are transformed to enter the digital realm. Digitide digitization further dislocates sounds from their material source, turning them into elusive data. Sounds embrace constant travel, flexibility, and flow at different stages of digitalization towards reaching a saturation state of an assumed post-digital condition. In the process, they are freed from the object. Sounds thus, in the contemporary condition, imply unsightly aesthetics of perception and subsequent object disorientation. In addressing this fundamental problem of an object disoriented behavior of sound while perceiving works of sound art, in this paper I emphasize sound's specific subjective inclination as artistic experience beyond a material objecthood. In order to examine the problematic relationship between sound and the artistic object, in this paper I draw attention to the works of a number of Indian philosophers who divided the sonic discourse in terms of dhvani, which means sound heard by the ear, and sphota, which means sound grasped by the intel intellect. They recognized sound's many possible interpretations beyond the material object or source of occurrence. This perspective helps theorize the streams of contemplative states that are potentially generated inside the mindful perception of the listeners experiencing the works of sound art, emphasizing the sonic subject's essentially withdrawn, inward-looking, and contemplative capacities, I pursue the claim that sound is less closely tied to the Kantarian category of substance and vision, and therefore, any attempt to frame sound into an artistic object or artifact to materially tie the viewer with it poses serious problem of a philosophical nature. What I listen to and what you listen to might be different from each other at the perceptual level. Working on this assumption, I have been doing experiments on individual and subjective listening within a collective setting at the course I taught at the University of Copenhagen. Based on feedback from students, I have arrived at the concept of what I would like to call the sonic subject, if some other researchers have not already claimed the term. Brandon Lovell has ex expanded his discussion on listening in this line towards the context in which interpretation must always takes place, always takes place, and pointed out its potential to foster subjective intensities from listening to living. In an ancient Indian aesthetic theory, subjectivity and selfhood embedded in sonic phenomena had been a highly discussed area. From S.S. Berlingley's writings, we know about the concept of spota, which I already mentioned, which indicates a sound changes into subjective thinking and language, an acquires meaning only after a certain explosion of sound. He states in his work, A Modern Introduction to Indian Aesthetic Theory, we not only utter sounds, We not only utter sounds, we can imagine sounds. A man can sing a song silently. He can make a mental division of time without it being perceived by any other person. It is no surprise that my experiments show why a given auditory situation appears to a drifting individual listener as liquid and amorphous. Newly heard sounds are juxtaposed with sonic memories, triggering the oral imagination. The individual listener 
elevates from the physical location and epistemic knowledge about the sound events that occur within the situation becomes disfigured, contributing to an unfixed, malleable, and evolving relationship between sound and the implied object when perceived as a li listener's mind. Nancy has rightfully asked why in the case of the ear is there withdrawal and turning inward and making resonant, but in the case of the eye, there is manifestation and display and making evident. The answer might be found if we set aside epistemic and ontological issues of recognizing the source or object of sound and instead focus on the phenomenological and inward looking subjective perception of sound within the self or mindfulness of the listener. Thus we can examine the way memory, imagination, and the personal experience of the listener alter the character of sound in its mindful perception. I refer here to the proclamation of John Cage, silence is not acoustic, it's a change of mind. The assumption in the subjective propensity of listening emphasizing the essentially self-contained nature of sound as an artistic experience lead to sound-based artworks being construed with an individual, private, and personal contemplation. I admit this position might ultimately be idealist. Moreover, if I begin with the subjective and then try to move towards the external world and towards other listeners, I, I face a question, is sound in anyway public before it is private. This conceptual positioning further problematizes the negotiation of the role of the listener in, in relation to an artwork. If listening is fundamentally subjective, then what is the point of making art? That is, curating a public object or event involving listeners other than the artist him or herself. Taking a clear point of departure in the object-oriented sound art experience, I propose in this paper an alternative methodology of sound art curating, which I term auto-curating. Addressing a practice-based approach, I refer to the recent sound art event listenings at the Museum of Modern Art, Medellin. The 12 multi-channel sound artworks were played in loop in a completely dark room of the museum where visitors were asked to enter and experience the works without any visual reference. This kind of acousmatic auditory situations incorporate the concept of auto-curating, which, which means I situate the curating of sound art in the higher level cognitive thought processes between the source of sound and the listener's mind that apprehends it, framing an experience of situated objectivity that is peculiar to sound's subjective nature at the listener's end. This method operates perhaps in the way artist Elon de Harris puts it in her doctoral thesis to create situations where sound can affect and activate people's experience in a personal way. What I call auto curating, what I call auto curating was already planted in earlier practices of sound art that considered sound as phenomena and did not construe its objecthood in the artistic mediation of the production and showcasing of what Kim Cohen has termed gallery arts. Insofar as an emphasis on the acousmatic experience of sound may shed more light on this method. Take for example, Francisco Lopez's performance installations, which are usually set in dark rooms in which he situates himself at the center instead of the podium. Audiences sit in concentric circles with their backs to Lopez and are blindfolded. The surround speaker arrays are arranged across the perimeter of the room and kept invisible. Audiences are forced to minimize any actual associations with the visual parts of the performance. In the program notes of his performance of buildings, Lopez writes, every listener has to face his or her own freedom and thus create. Although Lopez's passional and transcendental conception of music and fetishist attention to the purity of sound inhibit the freedom he keenly desires for the audience, he nevertheless opens doors to the negotiation of the role of the listener in relation to the artwork, 
by revealing the process of creation at the listener's mind. This process also finds resonance in Luke Ferrari's work, such as the Pascaria series, in which he posits a natural social situation for the listener by denaturalizing in the recording what is to be re-naturalized at the listener's end as a creative process. Kim Cohen spoke of his work as providing raw phenomenological data, the foundation on which thinking and doing proceed. On one hand, the process explores the per personal or private nature of listening. On the other, it en engages with the public and social ramifications of sonic phenomena. Brandon Lovell, in his pra pra artistic practices, suggests a somewhat similar methodology. He records room tones in his apartment and sends it to different architects, asking them to develop an imaginary plan of the apartment. <coughs> to conclude, as it stands, sound art is suited to directing the listener towards a personal or subjective context or a situational unfolding, rather than representing a sound object. The listener engages with memory, imagination, and contemplation, possibly creating meanings that are different from the intention of the artist or other listeners. This position explains the inherent characteristics of immateriality and ephemeral contingency embedded in sound art experience. Thank you. towards the end about inherent characteristics of sound and I wondered whether really is um, is this not partially just an educational discursive issue um, you know people are encouraged to reflect inwards on personal issues is it because perhaps they're not from a training in the sonic arts and don't have the discursive you know, uh, tools to which to try to describe these things as opposed to it being that sound is inherently some kind of oily or slippery and moves away from, shies away from words or something. I just wonder whether that was, um, are you suggesting it's to do with sound itself in a kind of almost metaphysical way? And whether, uh, yeah, it's just a, an educational discursive issue. Many people probably in this room would be better adept at pinning down aspects of sound that you seem to suggest are elusive um, by the nature of sound itself. I just wonder whether you could perhaps clarify that for me slightly. I talked about the subjective propensity, so it's better to concentrate on the listener than the artistic object. So um, maybe I can uh, reinterpret your question. Uh, you talked about educational purpose, but I'm thinking of um, focusing on the on the the behavior of the listener, perhaps visiting an exhibition, how the listener behaves, how the listener interprets. Yeah, the the selfhood. And, and the mindfulness of the listener that is uh, at stake here. Sure, yeah. I think I suppose it's partly what kind of a, you know, who that person is visiting. If that person's a musician or sound artist, then perhaps would disagree that the, the sound was inherently elusive because of the training that, that that listener has, whereas perhaps because of a lack of training and, and education regarding the specificities of sound is what might encourage people to assume that sound was inherently resistant to such things. So less about repurposing what you do for educational purposes, but rather does your statement regarding the inherent nature of sound rely upon um, a certain level of education and train, prior training in that, uh, that person attending the gallery? If that's perhaps slightly clear. I don't think um, any training is necessary in that context. It's a, uh, the personal positioning of the listener uh, with the memory and, and experience that, uh, that is important here. I don't think training, uh, or what kind of training I can question. Okay. Oh. 
Hi, I think this comes down to what you're talking about, subjectivity, and really, obviously, all texts, and you're talking of sound art being a, a, basically a media art, um, it's, it's going to be subject to multiple readings. But that's not a, a, a bad thing, that's a good thing, because people are going to take from the work what they, what they put in. And, um, and so I think you, this idea of closing it down, the way that you compose it to me, it seemed that you were saying that, well, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's open to multiple readings, it's a bad thing. I think it's actually a very good thing. So I just wanted to, to, to flag that up, really. And it, it was quite interesting, you were talking about, um, I, I like this idea that you, you talked about text being, uh, sound art being anchored through um, another sound, a little bit, bit way Shion writes about when he talks about film sound and how, sound, yeah, and particularly in radio where sound is anchored in drama, is anchored through text. And in a way, we kind of anchor our sound works through the conceptual narratives that we put around them. So in a way, we're always anchoring our work in, 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 in a written discourse as well as what we go into the gallery and hear first hand. There's always going to be something on the wall to kind of signpost the list. Uh, what's going on. So I just wanted to flag that up really, because I felt that was something that you hadn't really engaged with. Thank you. Sorry, more than a question, it's more than a space. Georgina Warren recently, uh, or saw her talk about a similar topic uh, in terms of uh, Kim Cohen's uh, mm, conceptualization or, or actually the framing of sound art as a sort of dead end of acoustic music. And uh, she presented the idea that the, the, this sort of problem with the object, uh, the object in sound art is actually a symptom of uh, a lack of post-conceptual critique within um, the music uh, academe. And uh, uh, I'm just curious as to what you think of that, uh, that uh, uh, conception. And uh, it, this seems like to be like an end run around that problem, potentially. Or maybe it's not a problem at all. Um. I didn't think this way, but um, I was referring to Joanna Demers' writing. He's also talking. She's also talking about uh, the problems of object and how electronic music, uh, the practice of electronic music, had shifted over the years. And uh, that is a major reference for me. But um, yeah, I'll go through the Bond's write, recent writings. This is uh, the final question from you, Jeremy. And maybe Rasmus, you can start. I think I have to start already because I'm running out of time. But they, the yeah. uh, for the recording, Jeremy should be helpful. Oh. Yeah. Um, so you're su suggesting, in a way, um, uh, a certain priority of, of sound work, uh, of sound art, which goes more directly to selfhood in a way than uh, many other forms of art, and I suspect there's something about uh, what you were mentioning about um, Indian philosophy, uh, which is critical about that, and I wasn't totally clear on that. I'd love to have a little bit more explanation if there's time of this concept of Devani and Skota. Um, because it was so fleeting, but yet I think it's somehow very critical to your argument, and it deserves elaboration maybe in the larger framework of... Uh, yeah, it's a division of uh, uh, sound perception into the source or the object, and its explosion of multifarious interpretations in the mind. So this division is important because then we can, uh, we have a context of talking about these different uh, areas of interpretation, possible interpretation or uh, multiple interpretations, which are not talked about when we think of sound object in a context of gallery arts or museum-based artistic exhibitions. It's a, it's a big claim, which I'd also like to substantiate, 
And so any clues we have to do that, I think are greatly appreciated. <laughs> sure. Okay. That was it. So, Ashley, please get ready and thank you, Buddha.